Ephesians, if you will, Ephesians chapter 1. And I want to continue on that theme. And I want to preach this morning on the riches of God's grace. The riches of God's grace. In Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verse number 7, the Bible says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Now that's a part of the sentence. The sentence continues on, but I want to stop there because it contains the thought that I want to focus on this morning, that the redemption of, uh, of through his blood brings us the forgiveness of our sins, and that all is according to his great grace. And so the Bible uses this term, the riches of his grace. It is a phrase that is found only in the book of Ephesians. It's found twice. And after we uh, pray here in just a second, we'll see the other time that it's mentioned uh, in the book of Ephesians. But what a tremendous thought it is that his grace is so rich to us that we can, that for us to understand, salvation is by grace and through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Amen. It's no no collection of 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 uh, events on our part or things on our part that we can do. And, uh, and I, this week, the Lord gave me a couple of opportunities to share uh, uh, the gospel with people that. That, uh, that I did not know and will probably never come across again. Uh, one uh, said he was definitely a child of God, and, but we talked about the gospel. I wanted to make sure that he understood it's not of works, lest any man should boast. It is all by God's grace. And, uh, and I want to just reinforce that this morning here in our service. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the word of God, for its clarity. Thank you for its, its uh, boldness to let us know that the way that we have the forgiveness of our sins is through your great grace because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that everyone here before they leave today is assured of that same experience to have trusted Christ as their personal Savior. If they have not yet done so, may they do so this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In Ephesians chapter 2, uh, beginning in verse number 1, I'll read a, a lengthier passage of Scripture, but we'll find that same phrase again, the riches of His grace. And in Ephesians 2 and verse 1, the Bible says, And you hath He quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. That word quickened means to be made alive. He has made you alive, <clears throat> wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Now, in, in verses 2 and 3, the Bible describes us all as having been under the curse of sin. Every one of us fulfilling the lust of the flesh uh, in the, in the, in, uh, uh, the desire, and the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And by nature, the children of wrath, <clears throat> sin, sin, seeks to capture you both in the flesh or the body and the mind. There is as much a, an emotional and mental component to sin as there is a physical one. People are well familiar with, you know, they say, well, yeah, somebody gets addicted to drugs or alcohol. Uh, and so that's a, that's a, a physical thing. But there's but how do you explain the addiction to pornography? That's not a physical thing. That's a mental thing. It's an emotional thing. It's a psychological thing. It's a thing within the, the, the mind and the heart of man. 
And I submit to you that that same component is, is active even in drug and alcohol addiction, that there's as much a, a, uh, a psychological or mental uh, component to those addictions as there are physical ones. And here we have it when the Bible says that you were uh, walking in time past according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, that's Satan, that's the devil. The Bible says, among whom all also we all had our conversation. That's where we all came from. Don't get lifted up with pride and think yourself above anyone else. We all came from there. <coughs> Fulfilling the lusts and desires of the flesh and the desires of the mind. And so sin captures you, seeks to captivate you, uh, both mind and body. And, uh, and so uh, people want to call it a disease. If it is, it's the disease of sin. You say, well, my particular addiction is this area or that area. Sin is not uh, p uh, picky about which one you gravitate to. It doesn't want to be your friend. Sin does not want to be your companion. It wants to be your master. It wants to control your life and bring you into submission. And so Paul said, uh, uh, I rather bring my body into submission. I bring myself into subjection to Christ so that while I've preached to others, I don't become a castaway myself. And so we have these first couple of verses uh, laying out our past. And then enter God in verse number four. But God, aren't you glad that? I was on my way to hell, but God. I was a sinner on uh, doing my own thing, but God. I was destroying, set on, and bent on destroying my own life, but God. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, <coughs> and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God not of works, lest any man should boast. Here in this passage of Scripture, we again see the exceeding riches of his grace in verse number 7. God's grace to us pours out his richest blessings because he is rich in mercy, he is rich in grace, and therefore we have the opportunity to come to Christ. I remember, uh, and I've used this illustration many years ago, uh, I remember in Bible college, uh, one of my assignments was to take uh, the first, I think, um, 13 or four, maybe, maybe the whole chapter, uh, chapter two of the book of Ephesians, and out diagram the sentences, all the sentences, do, do the English work, right? And then, and then uh, outline it, and then write uh, the conclusions that I came to from that. And I remember uh, early, early in the morning, amen, that's when most revelations from God come to me, you know, two, three o'clock in the morning, and, and I was up working on this, and I remember uh, when I came down to verse number seven, and I realized that when it says that in the ages to come, he, God, might show the exceeding riches of his grace. How? In his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. And it dawned on me, it came to me, that God wanted to use what he's done in my life to showcase his great love and his great grace. That the transformation of my life, God desired it to be on display, not so that men would see me, but so that they might see Christ, what God has done. One of the greatest personal illustrations I can give you 
from that is uh, the reminder of my own personal testimony, how that I did not get saved till I was 21. And as a teenager, uh, though I was in church, though I was, you know, uh, supposed to be certain things, I did not live at all like a Christian. And there were those that, that were in church with me when I was a teenager that knew me from those days. Now, fast forward ahead, 21 years old, God saves my soul, calls me to preach a year later, and I enter the ministry uh, after going to Bible college, and some years pass by, and I get asked to speak at a revival meeting down in central Illinois, uh, in a general area of where I grew up, not uh, about 50, 45, 50 miles away uh, from where I grew up. And I, I remember getting there, and I was a little bit taken back, I was a little bit surprised and shocked that there were many members of that church that uh, were in the same church I was in when I was a teenager. And uh, it was kind of like uh, uh, Jacob going back to face the past. And, uh, and I don't mind telling you, I was a little bit um, uncomfortable for a few moments. And, uh, and before the service, meeting up with all these folks, they say, oh, we remember you when you were a teenager. We remember you growing up. And I knew what that meant. And it was true. The tr thing is, you can argue against it, but it's true. And so I got up the first night of the revival meeting, and I said, boy, there's a lot of folks here that knew me growing up. And I said, I just want to testify that by the grace of God, I am not now the person I was then. And listen, what, a, uh, what a, an opportunity it was for me to live this passage of Scripture that in the ages to come, and listen, from the time this was written, we're living in the ages that were to come. That's today, all of the time, from the time this was penned, from the, from, uh, 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 from the first century of the church until now, it is the ages to come, and God wants to show his grace in his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. Our life is to be visible and open to a lost and dying world so that they can see and say to themselves, uh, and the Holy Spirit of God say to them, if God can do that for them, what can he do for you? God wants his grace to be displayed. And it is said correctly, the riches of his grace. And I want to give you some thoughts this morning from the, from the word of God concerning the riches of God's grace to help us focus in on the fact that it is not our works. It is not our... that Listen... If the change in me was what I did, then I get the credit. Then I could say, I could have said to that crowd, boy, yeah, I'm a different person today because of what I've, I, the decisions I made, because of what I decided to do, and I changed my life, and I decided to go a different direction, and it would all be about me. But the truth is, it's not. It's all about Christ. It's what he decided to do. It's what he, he has done in my life and continues to do in my life. And I want to just highlight the grace of God, the riches of his grace, and how they're illustrated in salvation. And I'd say, first of all, first of all, the riches of God's grace are illustrated by the nature uh, of, the, of the sin from which God was willing to redeem us the nature of the sin from which God was willing to redeem us. It is not misfortune that we suffered from. It was not circumstances that were our biggest problem. It was not our environment. It was not our misfortune. It was not those things. It was sin uh, that we were played with uh, from the first Adam until today. Men are born sinners and we are plagued with sin and all manner of sin. And I realize we classify some sin as more terrible than others. There is no greater sin than the sin of unbelief in the gospel. And that's what sends people to hell because they have not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. I was talking to a man a couple of days ago 
And he was asking me, he's saying, okay, so salvation by grace through faith and, and uh, et cetera. But he said, what about the guy? He's in the middle of a jungle somewhere. He's never had a missionary. He's never heard the name of Christ. He's never had that opportunity. Will, he, will God send him to hell? And, uh, and, you know, a lot of people are puzzled. A lot of people are troubled by that. But the truth of the matter is that the gospel goes into all the world. I believe this. I believe if someone is sincere and they want to know God, God reveals himself to them. I believe he makes himself known to them because, they, because that which may be known of God is clearly seen in that which is created. And so they're able to see the eternal power and godhood uh, of God the Father and, and understand the creative power of God and to seek him out. And listen, God, we classify sins as some not as bad as others. But every sin is the sin that sent Jesus Christ to the cross. The most mild thing we could do still is a sin for which Jesus had to die to pay for. But I want you to understand that God is not, does not limit himself to saving only good people. He doesn't limit himself to saving only those guilty of minor infractions. But he has, he has set, set himself to save those to the uttermost, from the uttermost, someone said, to the guttermost. I mean, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what your sheet says. It doesn't matter what the report of your life is. It doesn't matter what other people have known you to be uh, because the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And I want to highlight the riches of God's grace by saying there is no sin uh, from which God will not save you. There is nothing uh, in your life that you can point to and say, well, would God save somebody like me? And the answer is yes. Yes, he will. And I know, I do know the Bible talks about blaspheming the Holy Spirit. No, no uh, small thing. I heard, just when you think you've heard it all, I heard something this week. A guy was telling me, he says, I'm, I'm puzzled by this. There's this evidently, I, I, I mean, I don't live on, on YouTube and whatever. I, I don't care about cats playing pianos. And, and I, I just, it just it does not a, a big draw for me, amen? Um, but evidently there's this thing that is becoming a, a craze among young adults, young people, teenagers, to make YouTube videos of them blaspheming the Holy Ghost. It has become, it has become a rite of passage. It has become the latest uh, TikTok type uh, moment of fame, the, the latest fad, the latest craze uh, for young people to, to publicly on YouTube and TikTok to Say, to, to intentionally blaspheme the Holy Ghost. You say, why are they doing that? I have no idea. I haven't looked it up. I haven't searched it out. But somebody came and they said, what, what is going on with this? Just when you think you have heard everything, there's something that's beyond the pale. We, we, how can you not believe that we are in the days leading up to the coming of Christ? when it is a notable thing, a rite of passage in a so-called Christian nation to publicly uh, put on for display blasphemy the Holy Ghost. But I'm here to say to you, you might think your life is so, so marred by sin that God could not possibly save you, but I want you to understand God's grace is rich because of the depth of sin that God will save us from. It's not beyond your control, but it is beyond your ability to solve or to resolve. The drunken, the profane, the, the abhorrent, the loathful sins, the gross sins, the things that are, 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 are so bad that we we refuse to even really talk about them 
in open and in public and in polite company, as they used to say. But the grace of God is so rich that there, it, it's, not, it's not a barrier to him. It's not a barrier. I'd say also the riches of God's grace is illustrated by what God did to affect our redemption. By what he was willing to do to save us. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. As I was uh, this week having the opportunity to share Christ with a few different people. One guy said, well, the way I see the fall is that, that Adam's sin caught God off guard. Like he didn't see that coming. Because it had never happened before. No one had ever sinned before. Nobody had ever disregarded the command of God before. And so he didn't see that coming. And it kind of caught him off guard. And, and I said, I said, no, that's not true. And I'll tell you why, but the truth is even better. You see, I know it's not true because that means that God is not omniscient. Because that means there's something that God didn't know it was going to happen. And he said, well, yeah, but until it happens... I said, no. I said, do you believe in an, om an omnipresent God? He said, well, yes. That God, there's nowhere for God not to be, that God is everywhere at the same time. He said, yes. I said, do you believe that, how far do you believe that? He said, what do you mean? I said, is God limited by space or time? He said, no. I said, then if God is not limited by time, we, li we are limited by time. We, it, is, it, is, it is the last day of April, I know it didn't look like it outside this morning. We had three inches of snow at our house. Here's just rain. Didn't look like April, but it is. Uh, it's almost May. But Antoine said, hey, it's close enough. We're going to count it May. And I said, no, we're not there till we get there. Jesus might come. Amen. <laughs> but, uh, but I said, God is not limited by time or space. I said, that means this. That means there's no time which God is locked into. And he starts, his eyes kind of start rolling back in his head. And he's like, what are, you, what are you saying? I'm saying God is still in the beginning. And he's already at the end of the millennial reign. And he's here today as well. He is ever, I said, that's why he declares something to be so. And it is so because he's already there. And I said, and that's why he says before Abraham was... I am. Because there's no time when God does not exist. He's still in eternity past. He's in eternity future. And he's in the present today. That means there's nothing that would ever happen that God did not know about because he's already there. He's like, I think my head's going to explode, he said. He said, I can't even imagine that. I can't even conceive of that. I said, no, but it's true. But I said, Adam's sin did not catch God off guard, even though it had never happened before. God does not learn by experience. We do. God, God is knowledge. God, he knows everything there is to know. But I said, the truth is even better because though God knew what man would do, he allowed it already having a remedy, and that remedy is the blood of Jesus Christ, his only begotten son. That God went forward with the creation of man knowing full well that to create man and put him in the garden would eventually bring about the need for the death of his son, Jesus Christ. Oh, the riches of his grace. If we knew something was going to cost us so dearly, would we not avoid it at all costs? Sure we would. We would move heaven and earth as best of our ability to avoid paying such a high price. But such is the grace of God 
that even knowing what it would cost, he still, he still went forward and allowed man to disregard his command. And I said, oh, he knew. And yet, he still allowed man to, to, to sin, knowing what it would cost. Oh, listen, the riches of his grace are illustrated in what he was willing to do to affect our redemption. And then, let me say number three, the conditions, uh, excuse me, the, the riches of God's grace are illustrated by the conditions on which God offers salvation. You think about this. We, sin is the greatest scourge on man. As, as a creative, uh, as, as created by God, sin is the greatest scourge or blackness or stain upon man. Would you agree with that? And it carries the greatest penalty. Right? The wages of sin is death. And that death includes what the Bible describes in the book of Revelation, that death and hell are cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death to be separated from God for eternity in a place of torment. It is the greatest scourge upon man and the greatest penalty for that sin. And, and, it, could exact, and it exacts the greatest cost. There is, there is, since it is the greatest scourge, there is no price for anything to be paid other than paying for sin. So high that the only way for us to pay for it would be with our own eternal judgment. But Jesus Christ paid it for us. Why? So that God could offer it to us freely. So that God could say that it is by grace, through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. So that he could say, <clears throat> come without price, as the Bible says. Come without money. Come without barter and take of the water of life freely. If you're thirsty, come to him. And take the, the water of life. If you're hungry, come to him and find Jesus as the bread of life. The manna from heaven that satisfies the soul. Oh, the riches of God's grace is illustrated in what and, and how he's willing to offer it to us. For nothing on our part. That he provided the remedy full and free. The only condition being that we receive it as grace are you willing to ex to receive God's remedy by grace and then I'd say the riches of God's grace is illustrated by the fact that it's called the gospel what does the word gospel mean it means good news it's not sometimes we talk about uh, the you know the the plan of taking someone through the scriptures in order to show them how to be saved. We call it the plan of salvation. But it's really, it's the gospel, amen? That's, that's the Bible term. And uh, it's not, in the Bible, it's not called a system. If it was a system, you'd have to master it in order to benefit from it. It's not a law, or else you'd have to obey it to claim the promise, it is the gospel, which means the good news. It's, from, it's the good news from heaven down to earth. It's the good news from God to man. It's the good news of the divine love, uh, which, uh, um, which, uh, which quenches uh, uh, the, the penalty of our sin. Good news of great redemption paid out for us. Good news that God, through Christ, is redeeming the world unto himself. Good news that uh, to us. And that the very fact that it's called the gospel illustrates the riches of his grace. Because there is, outside of that, there is not really any good news. Because all that is left outside of Christ is eternal judgment. So the very fact that it's called the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, it's 
It's the, the, the message of the angels. I bring you good tidings of great joy. What is that? Well, if you have tons of money, you can pay your way out of hell. That's not good news for me. I don't have a lot of money. Well, if you're really especially talented, you can probably work your way out of, well, that's not good news for me. I'm not especially talented in any way. You see, the reason it's called good news is, is because it's come. Whosoever will, let him come and take of the water of life freely. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's why it's good news. And then I'd say, number five, the riches of his grace are illustrated in the concern that God has shown for us concerning our salvation. God didn't just make it to where, <clears throat> you know, like some of these movies where people go on a quest. <clears throat> you know, they got to find either the shining city or the whatever it is, you know, the ring or whatever it is. They got to go on the quest. We don't really know where it is. We have to go search for it. Uh, there's clues along the way. There's things that, you know, that might shape our path. There's obstacles in the way. We have to overcome all these things and go on the quest. And finally, uh, by our own effort, somehow we figure out the clues and we figure out the riddles and find our way to, you know, whatever it is. It's not. that Salvation is not a quest. Salvation, uh, God's grace is illustrated, the, one, the wonders, the riches of God's grace is seen in how much trouble he's gone to to make us aware of the remedy that he provided. <clears throat> he didn't just say, well, if you look hard enough, you might find it. No. The Lord Jesus Christ came and as he prepared to give himself a ransom for many, he called disciples unto himself. And of those disciples, he chose 12 and called them apostles. And upon their foundation, built the, found, built the New Testament church and said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And God facilitates. God finances. God uh, of funds, God takes care of of the opportunity, the getting the gospel to a lost and dying world, and we get to participate in that. But make no mistake about it; it's God that is in search of sinners. He's not doing it for His benefit; He does it for ours. We sometimes speak of those who are seeking God. But the New Testament speaks of God seeking us. The Bible talks about the good shepherd, amen? The good shepherd, when he goes out into the wilderness after the sheep that has gone astray. And we find throughout the New Testament in Luke 19, 10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Who's seeking whom? It's not man seeking God. Is God seeking man. 1 John 4, 10, here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. I realize this. I'm going to pause here for a moment to mention something. I realize that there are many variations of religion around the world. There are many variations of Christianity around the world. That all, not, not all uh, things that are called Christian are really strictly biblical, amen? Uh, I realize that. But I also want to point out that the very fact that, that, God's, that the testimony of Jesus Christ is almost universally known around the world, even in places where it's rejected. It is almost universally known. It is probably one of the, the greatest historical facts, most universally known historical facts to ever, to ever come into the ears of man is that Jesus Christ, God the Son, came to this earth. They might reject it as fantasy, but it is known 
It is it, 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 the, the, the sound of Jesus' uh, name uh, is, is, has gone throughout the world. You read uh, Romans chapter number 10 where it talks about the nation of Israel when it says how, they, how will they believe in whom they have not heard? How will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach except someone be sent? You just keep reading and it says, well, wait a minute. Have they not heard? Yes, the prophet Isaiah says that the, that the sound of his voice has gone throughout the world. Hey, I'm saying to you, no historical fact ever greater known than the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because God is seeking man. He's still looking for those who need to be saved. 1 John 4, 19 says we love him because he first loved us. This is God's conduct toward us. It wasn't that any of us were looking for him. No, we were likely going our own way, doing our own thing when the gospel of Jesus Christ was brought to us. We were on our way to hell, not content with our life necessarily, but, but neither had the answer to remedy it. And then God. Remember just a moment ago in verse number four, some of the greatest, one of the greatest thoughts in that verse is where it says, but God. Because we were without hope, without help except for God. The riches of his grace. All of these five things and more illustrate that it is by grace through faith, not of works lest any man should boast. And we know that because of the nature uh, of, from, from the sin that God is willing to save us from. We know it by what he has done to affect our salvation uh, we know it by the conditions that he offers it to us, freely given uh, to us if we will accept it by faith. We know it because it's called the good news. And the only way it's good news is if it's free. If, be, if it's already paid for, then it's good news. And then lastly, it's, good news. it's the grace of God. And we know the, the riches of his grace because of what the lengths that God has gone to to get the world to the and you look around the world. I mean, people openly, openly recording for posterity, blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Why does God not just rain fire and brimstone and burn this whole thing up? I'll tell you, because of His love. Because of His love, that's the riches of God's grace. If you're already saved, I hope today you are, you are once again uh, enamored with the riches of God's grace and what he has done for you. If you're not saved, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, I want, you to be, uh, I want it to be for, uh, just right in front of you, front and center, in you, that all that God has done for you, he can do no more. He's made it available. He's, he's paid the price. He sent his son, Jesus Christ. And the very fact that he has maintained Bible preaching churches for these 2,000 years. So there's somewhere, there's somebody taking the gospel to lost people it is evidence to what, what it matters to God that you get saved. It matters to God. That's why it's the riches of his grace. And maybe just in closing then, if you're saved, don't forget, God wants to use your life, his goodness toward you, to show the riches of his grace. Let your testimony be a testimony of God's grace. Father, I pray that you would help us this morning as we have opened the word of God and we have once again reminded ourselves of the richness of your grace, Lord, that we, in doing so, we have reminded ourselves of the great responsibility we have to a lost world. Lord, as we look around, we don't have to go uh, long distances. We don't have to go to foreign countries. Don't even have to learn a foreign language. Lord, we can just go out the door of our church and find people that need Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that in all these things we might be reminded of the great grace that was shown to us. And Lord, most of all also, if there are those here today that 
are not saved, that you might take this opportunity to accept Christ as Savior. What more could you have done than what you have? It is rich grace that brings our salvation. With our heads still bowed and our eyes still closed as we quietly stand to our...